Dr. Gulshan Sharma is our next, next guest speaker, and he will be talking to us in regards to a career in academic medicine. He is a Celia and Smith Distinguished Chair in Internal Medicine and Director of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the University of Texas Medical Branch here in Galveston. Um, Dr. Sharma um, earned his uh, medical degree in 1995 from Dayanand Medical College in India. He completed his internal medicine residency program at the Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, where he also served as chief resident. Uh, Dr. Sharma completed his fellowship in pulmonary and critical care at Yale University School of Medicine and earned a master's in public health degree during his fellowship training at Yale. He joined UTMB as an assistant professor in 2004. His research interest includes health services, quality, and outcomes. He received a K08 Mentored Career Development Award from uh, NIA and NIH on examining the role of provider continuity on end-of-life care. And recently, he was awarded the University of Texas System Health IT and Systems Engineering Grant to provide integrated care to patients with COPD and to reduce uh, readmission rates. He has numerous publications, including journals such as, in journals such as uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, and Archives of Internal Medicine. He is an editor-in-chief of the journal Core Evidence. And Dr. Sharma is also the director of the Medical Intensive Care Unit at the John Seeley Hospital. And his clinical interests include uh, sepsis, ARDS, and COPD. He also serves as a training program director for Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Fellowship. Please help me welcome Dr. Uh, Gulshan Sharma. What I really want to say is, um, especially some junior faculty here, is how to do it. And that was one of the things Norma asked me to speak about, is give an idea and help junior faculty, how can they achieve um, success in their academic career and stay in academia. So here are my, let me go through some of the things. So most of you already know that I mean, you know, medicine which is practiced in university setting is academic medicine. So in a community hospital also, if you are involved with residency training program, some people think it is academic medicine. For us who do health services research, we think it's a minor teaching hospital. A major teaching hospital is one that has affiliated with university hospital and medical student training. Now there are three pillars in terms of academic medicine, patient care, teaching and research, and the fourth one, which is a pillar in itself, is the dreaded administration. So as you grow, that pillar actually takes over all the other three underneath it. And the goal is to gain new knowledge and to improve patient care. Now, if you look at history of faculty track, in early 1900s, it was actually a triple threat. So a clinical faculty or a physician would actually do everything. They would excel in research, excel in teaching, and excel in patient care. And you wonder why, because there was nothing there to do. In 1900, most of it was bloodletting, you know. To some extent, you don't have any antibiotics to treat anything. So all you do is you see a patient, you go to your lab and figure it out, what's going to work in that patient. So you end up doing everything. So over the years, and under 1917s, you have designated track as a researcher and a clinician. The reason for that was you have significant growth in NIH funding, and you also have DRG, Diagnosis Related Group, introduced to reimburse. So the hospitals were very interested in making sure you have well-trained clinicians so you get reimbursed well from the Medicare system. Then in 1919s, you have further refinement. So you either are a clinician educator, a physician scientist, a clinician, or a researcher. And the reason for that was because you have an expansion in HMO, so they were interested in outcomes. So they wanted to make sure, and they were interested in quality. So that's why you have a further refinement of uh, faculty track. Currently, it is all driven, regardless of the track, it is driven by productivity and matrix. So pretty much, regardless of whether you are a scientist, a pure scientist, a clinician or a physician scientist, it all has matrix. So you got to bring your dashboard, you got to bring your scorecard, and you got to fill it to make sure you are meeting all your percent efforts under each category. So, <clears throat> what are the factors? So, when I was preparing this talk, you know, 
so what are the factors that influence the decision to choose <clears throat> academia? And there was a systematic review which was published about six years ago, and I think it is a very, very nice overview in uh, Journal of General Internal Medicine. And they reviewed over 250 studies, and they looked into, so the, the individuals who completed a graduate training or a fellowship or research are more likely to stay in academia. So people who have additional MPH or PhD, that was one of the reasons that the NIH was promoting MD, MPH, and MD, PhD, even during medical school, to try to generate more physician scientists. So that itself, whether it is a means to an end or ends to a mean, it actually was associated with staying in academia. Number two was desire to carry out research. So if during your residency you are involved with some research, doesn't matter how mundane it is, you are more likely to stay in academia versus those who did not do any research. Desire to teach, most people are interested as a clinician educator, and if you are interested in teaching, you are more likely to stay in academia. Influence of a mentor or a role model. And I'm going to spend a lot of time on that. Most of us are where we are because of the influence of a role model or a mentor. And I'm going to share more in depth with you as I go through this talk. Duration and stage of training. It was a very interesting study which showed if you ask a first year resident, they all want to go to academia. You ask a third year resident, they all want to go to private practice. So you wonder what happened during the first two, three years that they change uh, drastically. Um, in terms of, uh, so now we were interviewing for our fellowship applicant, so one of the things we always want to ask, are you going to stay in academia or private practice? So it's a double-edged sword. You want to have physician and community hospitals too taking care of you and your family members. You can't have everybody in academia. There's a lot of inefficiency in academia. It takes much longer, a lot of bureaucratic red tapes to get around it. So you want to have physician. You can't have everybody in academia. And there ain't that many positions in academia to hold everybody who get out to be in academia. So in general, the national rate is about 25% to 33%. So a quarter to third of physicians that get trained end up staying in um, academia. Now, some institutions are higher than others, but that's just a ballpark. Now, gender, there's always an issue of women. There was a lot of literature written about it. The women tend to balance their family life, so they tend to stay away from academia, and then there's a whole bureaucracy about men holding all the positions, being chairs and deans, and it is very hard for them to climb a ladder. So most females tend not to, but if you see there's a significant increase, and I'm surprised that if you look at the ratio in this room also, you know, it supports that the women are trying to go into academia. So the things are changing. So this was a very interesting study trying to look at why people choose which track. Now, during the same study, they actually did a qualitative and quantitative analysis, and they were interested in asking people why you choose uh, academia versus private practice. And here is the thing in terms of disincentives to career in academic medicine. So this was a focus group of female medical students at Duke University in North Carolina. So Duke would be considered that they would produce a lot of academic physicians. And here, uh, most of the female, they said they cannot accommodate diverse clinical pathways. So some people want to be a clinician educator, clinician scientist, so they thought that that was the reason they want to sway away from academia. Now, this was another study of a third year and fourth year um, um, residents and age match, gender match, internal medicine resident from two institutions. And the reason their disincentive was they dislike research, there was lack of autonomy and lower income. And when this was qualitative study, so they were asking the question. So when you go to quantitative study, pretty much across the board, low income, low income, low income, low income, low income. So if you are in for money, academia is not for you. So that's the major disincentive for people. Uh, going into, not going into academia. This was a systematic review, so if some of you are interested in it, you know, have a look at it. It's very well done. This is an old slide, basically showing you some disparities. So the idea here is not to show the exact figures, to show that even within primary care, you see a difference in terms of reimbursement or difference in terms of your salary as a primary care versus as a, um, in academic versus in uh, uh, private practice. Now, again, 
I think people need to take into account the percent effort that is put into clinical activity. So if you put all your effort, that means you are in your clinic in the morning from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and you see 30 patients a day, I can guarantee you that a lot of chairs here will pay you the salary of a private physician. However, the issue is you don't do that. You know, there is one half-day clinic here, two half-day clinic there. So you do not have full 100% clinical FTE when you're in academic medicine. So some, some of that time that is left is actually used for your growth, such as administration, research, or education. So, but the discrepancy in uh, subspecialty is huge. So pulmonary critical care starting salary would be around 180 to 220 based on the area you are, private practice, half a million dollar within your first year without any problem. So you can see the discrepancy in terms of uh, income. So sometimes when you are in your uh, you know, second or third year, you know, then you have to make a decision. So the question is, so do you have what it takes to be an academician? So I'm gonna go through all that and talk to you. So, question is planning an academic career, especially for junior faculty. The things you want to, you know, think through it, who are you, what do you want, and what are your needs? And sometimes, this is not a talk you're just going to have a cup of coffee and jot it down. You really want to put enough thought into these questions and try to formulate a plan on these questions. These are very simple questions, but you have to put a lot of effort to answer these questions. So I'm gonna go through that. So the question is to help you through that. Who are you? So are you a clinician educator? Are you a physician investigator? And are you a physician scientist? I took scientist out because scientist predominantly is for PhD researchers. So I am predominantly talking here for physicians um, in the audience. So clinician educator, physician investigator, and physician scientist. So the first answer you have to do is, which category do I belong to? And here is the answer to help you through that. So for a clinician educator, these people spend majority of their time at bedside teaching and providing patient care. They spend some time doing research in education, over 50% commitment to education, and then administration. So I would say Norma probably qualify as a clinician educator. Another person who could qualify for clinician educator would be Karen Zauter at UTMB. She spent most of her time with medical students and teaching Mercado. So those are true clinician educator in terms of spending their time and dividing their time. Physician investigator, on the other hand, do research and clinical activity, usually clinical research, and they do some mentoring, and they are mostly PI or co-PI of clinical trials. So a classic physician investigator would be the person who does a lot of clinical work and actually have pharmaceutical-sponsored clinical trials or NIH-sponsored clinical trials. So that means they are not the one who are driving the question to study, but they are the one recruiting patients to those clinical trials. So Avi Markovitz could be an example of physician investigator because they run a lot of cancer-related trials um, in their um, uh, clinics. So that would be an example of a physician investigator. Now, last one is a physician scientist. It's usually an MD, PhD, or MD, MPH. It doesn't have to have always MD, PhD, or MD, MPH. You could spend a lot of time in your basic science research during your fellowship or residency and can be a physician scientist. The thing here is they spend 70 to 80 percent of their time dedicated to research and they are usually or always or mostly NIH funded and usually they do basic or translational research. Now you can say the classic example here would be Dr. Alan Brazier. So he is your pure sine qua non for a physician scientist at UTMB. So, so once you figure it out, which pillar you belong to, are you a clinician educator, a physician investigator, or a physician scientist, then you have to look into what is my one-year plan, a three-year plan, five-year plan, and 10-year plan, and beyond. Most of those who know me, I usually have a plan for a week. That's about it. So my calendar only tells me, okay, this is where I have to be. This is what I need to do. And it does help because you have a long-term and a short-term plan, but if you fulfill your short-term plans, you will fulfill your long-term plans. The problem is 
you have this grandiose long-term plan and you screw up your short-term plan. So if you don't meet your short-term plans, you are never going to achieve that grandiose view that you have 10 years down the road. So, so, so the thing is then to understand, so the easiest way to do is once you fulfill yourself that which pod you belong to, then the easiest step to go is, okay, what are the APT requirements at my institution to move that ladder, okay? And people do not pay attention to that. And as a junior faculty, it is very important. Most people will take five to seven years from assistant to associate, and then anywhere from seven to 10 years from associate to full professor, depending upon which institution you are. But there are clear guidelines. And the good thing about guidelines, it, it helps you plan your career. And you can check mark along the way through as you are growing that, OK, am I meeting before I meet my division chief or chair? Do I have everything it takes? You don't want that if the chief comes and hey, I don't think you are ready for that. You don't want to think that, oh, because he hates me, that's why he doesn't want to promote me. You know, he would give you black and white because one of the things that division chief and chair wants is promote their faculty. And I think, I mean that way, they do want to promote. And that nobody wants to demote their faculty. It doesn't look good if you have to demote. You want to promote your faculty, but the faculty also has to help. Okay? So, so the question here is, once you go into that, so what do you have to show for promotion? So you have to have teaching, education activity, advancing knowledge for research, clinical activity, peer recognition, and service. I didn't put much uh, slides related to service, but I just want to give you a few examples of services to be part of divisional, departmental, and institutional committees. Even though junior faculty tend to say, oh, I only have this much time, but it is important to get out and be parts of those. So service is very key for your success. So you want to be part of either you know, IRB. You want to see how much time you have and then commit according to that which committees you think fulfill your need. Like School of Medicine have so many committees. They're always looking for people to be on that, like admissions committee. So things of those nature. And always make sure that when you're looking at that you're checking on these, some of these blocks. Okay? And you have to show excellence in two to, to be promoted. So you want to make sure that you are moving across that uh, ladder. Now here are some of the examples how to show that. So in teaching, Teaching, you know, like uh, you have to show volume. So you can say number of POM, one, two, three. The, the thing with university academics is you got to have teaching of medical student. It's unfortunately resident and fellowship, fellows teaching doesn't count that much when you're putting it on a piece of paper. So you want to get involved with the PBL, problem-based learning courses, practice of medicine, one, two, three, clinical skills, and some of that does not take that much preparation, but they need a clinical person to help them with physical exam and evaluating a patient, so that is important. And any awards, you know, teaching excellence in teaching is already an excellence. If you got within the residency program or through medical school, they do give Red Apple or Apple, some Apple award in the, from the medical school, so those are all good. A continuing education, another thing is quality. Quality of teaching is also important. So your evaluations by your medical student is always good to keep that together, put it together. Mentoring and supervision is mostly in terms of, you know, if you are helping young individual residents or medical student in research, so you want to show whether you serve on their thesis or dissertation committee or papers or articles that you have written with them. And uh, educational committee is also a service, as I said y to you earlier about serving on School of Medicine admissions committee. You can serve on even committee for interviewing all those applicants. So it will take few hours of your day, and it is usually during that three or four month window, and you can plan to be active, um, involved into that, okay? Scholarship of teaching is all about peer-reviewed publication. Uh, one way of showing your excellence is peer-reviewed publication. Book, chapter, editorial services, recognition by peers, and grants and contracts. So this is just a rough draft of when you're planning, and you can check, you can go download the APT proposal, and you can see, okay, do I fulfill these criteria, and what do I need to do next year to make sure I can check mark on one or two of these boxes? Because you have five years, you know. Very rarely you're going to get promoted before five years. 
So five year is the least or the earliest you get promoted. And then you want to make sure that you have that much time to accomplish what you need to accomplish so that you fulfill all those criteria. Now, another thing which I think is some junior faculty do not pay attention to, you have a letter from chair, okay? The division chief's gonna write that one. But you need to have six additional letters. Three from UTMB, which are not from the your department, and three from outside. And some faculty members are not able to get outside letters. And so you wanna make sure that when you go out for national conferences, you network with people. One of the thing is these letters should not be from your prior training program. Or you have nothing with that person who's writing the letter. That person is independently reviewing your CV and writing the letter for you. So you want to make sure, one of the thing when we review these things is, is like there's always these letters and then either that person is trained with them or they write that thing, oh yeah, you know, we got together at high school and then we have separate paths and then he went somewhere and I went somewhere else. So you want to make sure that even if you went to high school together, it should not reflect on the letter. So it should be an independent, uh, it should be an independent review based on the CV. All right, so now just to give you an idea, it's hard to juggle everything nowadays, okay? So it is hard to have a triple threat. It is hard to do research, clinical work, administration. So this was an old slide. And this is mostly related to physician scientists. And one of the things NIH got very puzzled with that they start awarding MD-PhD and MD-MPH thinking that the pipeline of physician scientists will grow what happened was over the years, they got enough people, then you have a lot of established investigators already in the pipeline. The funding level did not increase, competition increased, so the pay line went way down. Now it is in single digit. So what happened is a lot of MD, PhD, yeah, they get the career development award, to now to go to R01, they are dropping like flies. So they are going into private practice, or some of them even got clever, they're going into pharmaceutical companies because they have very good basic science skill and I knew a lot of them uh, during my training and they end up going into pharmaceutical companies in terms of drug development. This is just to show you the graph that I got from the gastroenterology journal. K08 and K23 are carrier development award, basically showing that there was a peak in uh, 04, 05, uh, and after that it has flat. The number of applications going in has gone up, but the number of applications that get awarded have gone drastically. And Sarah has probably helped a lot of people during her time, and she will tell you uh, based on even her own end that she helps through that it, it is getting very tricky even getting career development awards now. This is a thing that uh, is like Ponzi scheme, beware of the prophecy scheme, you know, don't get scammed, you know, how does professor work, you know, he will convince all the junior faculty to come join, do the research, then he will tell, bring more people on it, and then you ran out of grant funding and everything collapsed. So that's, you gotta be aware of that stuff. All right, so now what are the challenges? So if you look into that, in academic medicine, there is always a salary differential. So I don't think money is everything. So, but there may be people who will differ from me. Um, you only need so much to live, but if money is what is your calling, then you need to stay away from academic medicine. Like president would say that, um, you know, it is, your salary would be equitable, not equal. So you can't say that, hey, I'm seeing more patient, I need to get paid as much as the president, no. President is gonna get his salary, you will get your salary commensurate on your experience and MGMA standard. So loan and debt is a major issue. You know, average loan for medical student coming out of residency and fellowship is 200,000 or above. So they defer, 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 and then eventually once you get out of fellowship, you have to start paying it back. So then you have to see how much other expenses you have and can the salary cover that. NIH has come up with a lot of loan repayment things. It helped to an extent, but sometimes your loan is too much that that loan is not sufficient. Uh, lack of job security, that is true with everybody. You are, if you have your own practice, you know, you can continue to do, you are in charge there, but remember there you got to provide for everybody else before you take every, anything home. So there is an insecurity there also in private practice. 
Uh, lack of proper mentoring. One of the major things for junior faculty is they do not get proper mentoring. And the third thing is bureaucracy. Everybody thinks there's a lot of red tape. It is hard to move above, up the ladder and it is difficult to succeed in an academic medicine and you just become the lowest runt there and just keep circling and there is no way to climb up the ladder. So those are some of the challenges to academic medicine. Now, how, so the idea here is so giving back to just to give you a background of academic tracks, how you plan, you know, and what you need to do to be successful. And my goal is to give you my example. I hate to give my example, but Sarah has done in the past, and she said, no, you've got to give an example. I said, fine, I'll go through it. And, um, so, and, and I'm going to give you, that doesn't mean that's the perfect example. That has worked for me. Um, a lot of it could be serendipity or some hard work in that. So, but I just want to share with that how I did it and go from there. So I, moved, I came here in 1995. Uh, from India after finishing my medical school and then did a externship here at UTMB in uh, 1995 and applied for residency. At that time the exam was paper, exam was only once every six months, so you have to have full year and a half before you can apply for it. So I applied, my wife wanted to stay in Texas because she was here, all her family was here. So I didn't get an interview here at UTMB. I did my nine months of externship here, so I went to um, Henry Ford. So I did my residency at uh, Henry Ford. During my residency, it took me about uh, two years. You know, each time you go through a rotation, you love nephrology. Next time you love hemonc. Next time you love pulmonary critical care. So it wasn't true to me that, okay, which path I was going to uh, take. And then what happened was during, during my residency, it's a 1400 bed hospital and there was no cap during that time. We would put like four or five swans at night, just like random, those kind of stuff was happening in ICU uh, during those era. And then I met a mentor, Bruno De Giovanni. He was my first mentor. He was young at that time. He came from Michigan. He was trained at Michigan and he had an MD, MPH, very nice guy. And and I was in my late second year, you have to apply for your fellowship. I wasn't ready, I wasn't sure. And then I got offered a chief residency, so that means I have extra year to think. So I got, you know, start talking to him. And they were doing this project on uh, effectiveness of ATS guidelines for community acquired pneumonia. So they have all this data, they want to see whether these guidelines were helpful. So he said, you want to be part of the project? I said, sure. And so my job was to collect the data and help them through the process. And there was a second project with Bob Heisey, who is at Michigan right now, looking at ventilator pathways to decrease the duration of mechanical ventilation in COPD patients. So those are kind of my early research things. So remember, as I said in my beginning, in that systematic review, it showed research during academic, research during residency will let more likely to retain in academia. So these were my two research projects during my residency. And the good thing with that paper was it got highlighted at ATS meeting in Toronto because it was one of the things you're supporting the American Thoracic Guidelines. It is, a large, it is our largest representation of pulmonary critical care physician. So they love that we are supporting their document because most guidelines are expert opinion with little evidence early on in early 1990s, late 1990s. So, so it just basically became a big news at ATS and that was pretty much what ended up happening with the, this study. So then I was looking for fellowship. I applied for fellowship program and my interest was that, hey, you know what? I want to do an MPH. Now, I didn't know what the hell I want to do with it, but I, I said, you know what? I, I want to do an MPH. So there was like a bug in my head. So I interviewed at all major program for pulmonary, Wash U, Denver, Michigan, at Yale. And interestingly, only place that offered an MPH during fellowship was Yale. They had MPH and PhD both during fellowship, but PhD you got to stay an extra year. MPH was only uh, within three years I could get my thing. So, that, so before I go into that, this is just during residency, we continue to work on, so we actually have single largest data on pleural effusion. So I have studied pleural effusion long time ago. It was all about, we have 1,500 patient population. Henry Ford is probably one of the premier institution 
It was actually one of the seven clinics, if you don't know the history about Henry Ford. Seven clinics were built in early 1930s, 1940s. Mayo Clinic, Henry Ford, Cleveland Clinic, Leahy Clinic, Oshner Clinic, and one more. They were all Harvard, Yale trained physicians who do not want to do research, wants to do patient care, so they end up opening these uh, hospital, and it was all supported by Henry Ford. They were making a lot of money, so they didn't care whether you made or not. He will write the check to balance the book at the end of the thing. Now it is one of the largest uh, uh, hospital in, in, in Detroit doing everything at this point. And so I end up doing a lot of pleural fluid related stuff. And this was all pre oral presentation down at a chest meeting when I was doing my first year of fellowship. So, so during my fellowship, so one of the thing was, you know, you, there it is basic science. It's very hardcore basic science. So my division chief uh, there was Jack Elias, and he's probably another replica for Alan Brazier, hardcore physician scientist, trained at UPenn, want to study asthma, multiple mouse models, and well-known in his field. And 13, 15 people lab, so pretty much all fellows have to go work in the lab. And I hated mouse, I didn't want to do it. I said, I do not want to do the lab. So, and then just a year before my, um, uh, before my match, he, they started offering an MPH for fellows. So, person before me was Margaret Pisani, she is an uh, expert in delirium, after that was Claude, who is a sleep apnea and stroke, and then I came along and I joined an MPH program. And that was an interesting story too, because I didn't take a, a MCAT here, and so they wanted me to take a GRE, because I have to have a GRE to go into an MPH. They said, you know, sure you are a physician, but you got to do GRE. So I got to get a book and study for GRE, and you know, whatever that was worth, you know, all it takes is a phone call from your division chief to that guy that, hey, give this guy an MPH, he'll be fine. So, so I did end up doing an environmental health sciences MPH and did my chronic disease, basic stuff in biostat and things like that. So during fellowship, the issue was you need to have a mentor to do research, so all of our mentor within the d division was basic scientists. So then I got out and then I worked with uh, Vinnie Coaglarello. He's an ID guy, very nice infectious disease person. And so I end up working with him because I have to submit a thesis for my MPH. And they were having this longitudinal data that they were already collecting for studying patients with delirium in hospitals. So if delirium actually got invented or discovered at Yale with the Sharon Inouye. So all delirium related work came from there and they have longitudinal data that they have collected. So I was studied in, interested in looking at short and long term functional outcomes in patients with uh, community acquired pneumonia. So it was already a data set showing that a lot of older people do not recover to baseline after an episode of pneumonia. So it took us a while, so finally infectious disease of clinical practice accepted it. Buddy of mine, Mike, uh, um, he did his fellowship, he was a basic scientist, and we usually go to ATS together, and I was joking with him. I said, hey, got it published in a IDCP. He said, what's that journal? I said, hey, it's impact factor is two. And he said, two? I said, that's okay, as long as it's not negative. So it got published, you know. And, and that was the first publication um, that I had uh, during my fellowship. So, so after that, I decided, because my wife said, either you stay, because I was offered to do additional year uh, with Tom Gill. You know, he's a big guy in physical therapy at Yale. They have a very big geriatric services up there. And they do a lot of aging related research as big as we have it here. And um, so my wife said, hey, if you want to stay, you can stay another year. I'm going to go home in Texas and see you whenever you're ready. So I said, no, I need to find a job. So I came down, looked at both MD Anderson, Baylor, UT Houston, and here. And uh, at that time, you know, uh, major challenges. So I actually liked UTMB because here everything was under one umbrella. I thought this is great, it is bread and butter pulmonary critical care, it's not completely cancer, it's not private practice, so it is what I really wanted to do. So the challenges at that time when I joined was there is no division director, there was no chairman because Bill Mitch intervie interviewed me and then he retired or he moved to Baylor and Randy was just given 
we didn't even have an interim chair at that time. I think Randy was just named interim chair. And there was no protected time. So one of the things I think a lot of uh, um, junior faculty need to know, there are some adversities. There is always say, oh, don't go to a place when you don't have a dean, or you don't have a chairman, or you don't have a division director, because there is nobody to negotiate. All I wanted was a job at that time, so I signed the paper, and I took the job in uh, 2004. Shortly after that, uh, Bill Calhoun came as a division director. So in 2004, uh, you know, I was gung-ho, I want to study obesity and ICU outcome. I don't know why. So I wrote one stuff during my fellowship, and I was all writing my IRB protocol. I put together everything, and I bought a measuring tape because I want to see that obese people should not be ventilated with higher tidal volume. They should be ventilated with lower tidal volume. Just because you're big doesn't mean your lungs are big. And there is some data, and I wanted to do this study. So when I went, you know, when you come from outside, you have more eyes than you care. Like, who is this guy walking around with measuring tape? So I'll tell the nurses, I said, hey, would you mind measuring the height? She would just look at it and say, what are you talking about? He's 5'6". I said, no, I want you to measure it. I want to make sure the height is accurate. So they would get pissed all the time. So, but I would have a measuring tape, and I would measure it, collected the data. We have over 100 patients that we collected. And that was one of the things I was interested in um, uh, looking at. And then we presented that work. Um, later at American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. And right around that time, I started going to morning reports. I met Randy, and, and he said, hey, you know, um, there's a guy here, and you want to meet somebody. So the question here is, I could have continued that cycle. You know, I was enjoying my clinical care and love what I did. And the issue is the success has to depend on relationship process. That's what the results get delivered. So the relationship is you have to form some relationship within your network, and you have to have a process within that relationship to accomplish the results you are interested in. Those are some of my own ideas. I didn't think they were going to take me anywhere, but something that makes me happy. That was it. <laughs> so mentor. Okay. So mentor is critical. And here is the thing, there are a lot of different kinds of mentoring, and I think a lot of people don't understand a difference between a mentor and advisor. They use it in the same sentence. And the issue is there are three types of mentoring. It is a natural mentoring, a situational mentoring, or formal facilitated mentoring. Out of these three, the formal facilitated mentoring is the most important. Situational mentoring is you got upset with somebody, you want to go talk to somebody, that's situational mentoring. Natural mentoring is you're putting in the center line, you don't know which way to put the catheter in, you tell the person, hey, don't do this way, this is how you should do. That's just a natural mentoring that you do that. Facilitated mentoring is what takes you where you want to be. What that means is you've got to have regularly scheduled meetings. You just don't walk into somebody's office, hey, what you're doing? You know, I just want to say hello to you. That's not proper mentoring. So you want to understand about formal facilitated mentoring. And I attended this course, and mentoring is not training. It's not telling you how to put a central line in. It is not how to put a PA catheter. It is okay. It is more of an advice. It is not coaching. It is not consulting. It's not a relationship between an employee and a supervisor. So mentoring is anything than that. Okay? So what that is, is what does mentee hope in a mentor? You've got to have a sounding board so you can talk to that person. Help prioritize goals. So, you know, you may have a great idea, but mentor has gone through their life and they say, you know what, it's not going to go anywhere. And, uh, and I'll explain to you that. Teach process and strategic planning, okay? Assess, they actually have an inside track. They know whether the dean's going to be here or get fired, okay? So they will tell you, don't invest in it. It's not going to work out because they are not, they know the inside track, what is going on in the hospital or the institution, and they are available. And the last thing a mentee want a mentor to be a nice person. That's questionable. You know, it just depends upon what your goals are and whether you want to see that. So here's my mentor. So I'll go through this. One other thing is Randy uh, made me meet Jim. So here the issue was Jim was more of a sounding board. And Jim said, OK, what's your interest? I said, obesity and ICU outcome. He walked away. And he said, God, this guy had no clue what the hell he's talking about. So then we used to meet uh, on a regular basis. And uh, so 
he basically start coming up with, okay, what are you interested in? I said, I'm interested in end of life care. Then we start coming up some things that could make sense. And deep down, I would go here and there. He, one of the things he always do is he would put it on his calendar that you're going to meet me every two weeks. So I'll be on his calendar Thursday morning, 9 to 9.30. And I would dread that. You know, every Thursday I have to go meet with him, and I have to have something ready to say or do something about it. So another thing is you don't need just a mentor. You need a mentoring team. So with him, I was actually, so Gene's going to spin, is Gene Freeman. So Gene would actually help. Uh, buffer some of the things and and she would be a great person to go over with some of the things I would do and then Dr. Ko was our analyst and she's one of the smartest biostatistician and she helped me understand large database analysis last but not least is Sarah and I'll tell you why Sarah is important because I could not write what shit <laughs> and and I'll tell you right here is because it is very difficult to write something which is publishable, okay? So one of the major kickback I would get all the time is you got to put more articles in it. He would say, you are very stringent with your articles, A and the, what are you talking about? It looks good. So I think one of the thing is if you want to be successful, you got to have a, a mentoring team and they give you advice at a different level. Okay, and you want to make sure you have that cycle or circle around you as a sounding board. So Gene could be a sounding board, Yong Feng could be an analyst. Once I write it, I still do not send anything out until Sarah looked at it. Never. Okay. And and it, and so to me I think it is important to have that and the whatever success I had, it is indebted to my mentors over the years. So I don't think, they, they always say, you know, there's always a hand of a woman behind man's success. I think for an academic success, you have to have a mentoring team to help you go through this. So this was the first paper. So Jim got this call from NIH or NIEHS. He said, Sharma, they want me to write on effect of norm, aging on respiratory system physiology and immunology. Do you want to do it? So one of my advice to junior faculty is never say no. If somebody asks you something, doesn't matter how hard you are working, what you are doing, do not say no. I had no clue about this, okay? I did not know how I was going to write. I did not have any idea. I said, sure, we'll do it. So this was actually the first paper we wrote together, Effect of Aging on Respiratory System Physiology and Immunology. It is one of the most cited papers. Even in the Journal of Clinical Interventions in Aging, we were going to send it to JAGS or something. The Clinical Intervention in Aging just started. And that Clinical Intervention in Aging was a journal from Dove Press. Okay? And I'll tell you why these things are all interconnected. Okay? So remember Dove Press. This was just released by Clinical Intervention in Aging. So we submitted that, and it got published. And I still get emails from people who couldn't download the hard copy to send it to them. So this was first paper. So just to give you a sidetrack, so as a clinician, you know, I'm still spending all my time in the ICU, and you want to keep, you know, in touch with other things. No effort should go wasted. There should be an end to every mean. So during an ICU, I had this young girl. She was 22 years old. She came uh, to um, Galveston for summer vacation, and she was in that Hampton Bay pool sitting outside. And this guy came in who was a pool guy. He actually mixed chlorine and hydrochloric acid right in front of her and dumped it in the pool. And there was a huge fume of chlorine. And she got massive inhalation injury and developed ARDS. So she had a very prolonged course. And I said, you know, I have never seen anything that bad. Had an ARDS, 22, a mother at bedside all the time. And we did all the literature, so I couldn't come up with anything. Steroid, no steroid. And so Raj was my fellow at that time. So I said, hey, you know, let's do this and look it up everything. So we reviewed all the literature, and we published this in um, Journal of Critical Illness. And uh, it is still also one of the cited paper, even though it was a case report, because it has a very extensive literature review about this field. This was around 2007. So one of the things is you always want to make sure that you continue to uh, 
build up on everything you are doing. Do not let your effort go wasted. And uh, I tell all the fellows and junior faculty, abstract is the lowest denominator. Anything written in good English is going to get accepted at national meeting because that is how they collect their money. They want to have everybody come there. But to go to the next step is peer review publication is where you want to take yourself. Once you're published, then you know. I still get emails every few months from a person in Australia. She read this paper, and they couldn't have this paper because she had a chlorine inhalation injury. She was a swimmer. And she said, my asthma acts up. Do you think it was chlorine related? Now, I don't know what happened, but she had these questions. I said, sure, you can go get yourself checked. So she had a bronch and stuff. So she's kind of like my pen pal. So she'll email me every four months or so, giving me all the bronx picture and saying that this is what's going on and helping. So just to give you an idea, so remember the, this one thing. So then while we were doing all that stuff, there are other stuff that was going on. So we came up that, hey, something which is interesting would be to study continuity and end-of-life ICU use. So end-of-life ICU use being an intensivist, Jim's interest was also end-of-life. So we came up with this idea that we need to study con continuity. And because there's a growth of hospitalists and people are either practicing either outpatient or inpatient, there is no continuity with your primary care physician. So outpatient to inpatient continuity will lead to lower end of life and more appropriate uh, end of life uses. So this was our model that we put together. And during the same time, this is 2007, UTMB was going through EPIC implementation. And I became the lead for us for the division because I was interested in, there was a rapid response team that was being built during that time because it was a JCO requirement. And there was a study that got published in Lancet which showed that it helps or some people would argue, and then I got involved with anticoagulation and quality. This is the time when uh, you, MD Anderson first started offering CSC, clinical safety and effectiveness course outside of MD Anderson. So I ended up taking that course in 2007. So the same year I uh, put my K in, I was involved with this. So one of the things that tells you I know a lot of people will say stay focused. I would say do not stay focused because you do not know what's going to materialize. And I'm totally uh, is in spread out. Okay, so I, I know people may disagree with me that staying focused will help. Now I can tell you this is the same thing going on in 2007. We submitted a KO8 in 2007. Our original score was 180. We did a revise and resubmitted. At that time, the cutoff for funding was around 150 or 155. So we resubmitted it, got a score of 124, and the grant got funded in 2008, and it still have last year going in. So that's the issue with uh, K and mentoring and helping you through that. So while we were doing that, so you got Hurricane Ike, okay? So this was right when the grant came in. September 2008, we have Hurricane Ike. And um, so the question is what to do now, where to go. A lot of uh, unrest. You guys already seen this picture. So during the same time, we have already written our paper. And this paper, you've seen it, got published in JAMA, Continuity of Outpatient and Inpatient Care, because we were working during Hurricane Ike at my house because Jim was staying at my place because he didn't have any, uh, any of his thing working. So we were meeting on a regular basis. <laughs> and uh, irregular basis, yes. And to get, go through this, and this paper ended up in, in uh, JAMA. During the same time, because we have this whole issue of continuity, we were also thinking about hospitalists. And creativity there was, there was no definition of hospitalist in claims data because you can find a code for pulmonary critical care, you can find a code for cardiologists. Hospitalists could be anybody, a geriatrician, an internist. So we came up with this clever idea of describing based on their claims. If the majority of their claims come from inpatient care, they are hospitalists, and we did some further stuff. The major ticking point for this paper was they want us to validate it. They, that was the major sticking point. So. I called in seven different places where my buddies were. So the best way to know you are a hospitalist if you are practicing as a hospitalist. So we knew their name. We knew where they were practicing. We know their UPIN number. So we look at their claims, and we validated it using their claims from seven different places throughout US. So that led us saying that, hey, our definition for hospitalist was valid. 
So that led us to this publication with Dr. Um, Ko as a, a chief main uh, first author. So, so while I was down in India during my father had an illness, I got a call from somebody in, um, uh, from Sweden. They said, hey, we saw your paper on aging immune system that you wrote about effect of normal aging on respiratory immunology and physiology, which I didn't know what the hell I was writing. So they said, hey, we are having a COPD symposium, international symposium in Lund, Sweden, and we want to invite you. We want you to give a talk on this topic, aging immune system and its relationship to development of COPD. Now, yes, I'm a pulmonologist. I am not a basic scientist. I had no clue. Now, the question is, do I accept it or do I reject it? So what, what is the answer? Accept, OK? So what I did is I said, sure, I'll do it. And so then, then I said, okay, I can do it myself, so I need to find somebody who can help me. So I did the main part of it, what needs to be done. So a buddy of mine, Mike Shim, who was a fellow with me, he's a basic COPD guy. So he knew all NF-kappa B signaling, neutrophils, what happened. So I said, hey, Mike, I want you to put that part together. And then we said, okay, we'll have Nick Hanania, who's at Baylor. He's also a COPD expert. I said, Nick, I want your help in this to see what you think about it, so that way you can read it over. So, so got it, traveled to Sweden and presented it. There were like 13 COPD experts internationally, and I was there, thought of as an expert, I guess. And I gave my talk, and then this got published in that. So there is, so you can see how one thing leads to another and to another. So. This was a paper that got published in our respiratory journal. So this goes back to nothing gets unfinished, so rapid response team. So in 2007, we got started at RRT, and I was very gung-ho that we need to write about it because I don't think RRT makes sense in academic center. What people do is a study get published, and they try to implement across board. It may work given that context. The study was from Australia. So the healthcare from Australia could be very different. The way we practice, not even in the US, at UTMB institution could be very different. So the idea there was, does rapid response team in an academic center make a difference? So we basically showed that there was no difference in terms of in-hospital codes, in number of transfers to ICU. All it does is increases the number of transfer to ICU. Our hospital mortality did not change during that study period. So this is basically showing that it was an extension of what you got involved, then you want to show and, and finish it. I don't think we send it to too many journals. We just thought, we always look at, okay, which journal hasn't published that work, and we just send it to that, and sometimes that's a success. So, so then came, okay, what else is next? So what happened was I was involved with Epic, and then UT System released this thing that they want to pay money for health IT. Now, and we wrote a grant for Health IT at, at that time, and that got funded, and it still have money in it to study integrated Health IT to um, provide uh, care for patients with COPD and heart failure to re reduce readmission rate. And the second part of this grant, which I was on, is on I2B2. So that's another IT grant that was uh, funded for uh, UTMB in uh, uh, 2000, I think, 10. So it's still going on. So. During that time, I thought, you know what, I need to improve my English. I can't depend on Sarah for too long. So, and then with a K, you got the money, so you can go to. And they said, Jim said, hey, there's a Taos writer's retreat. You should go to that. I said, OK, I'll go to Taos. So what happened is this is sponsored by University of New Mexico. And I was always impressed. One of the things I always like to read is a, on being a doctor and a peace of mind. A peace of mind in JAMA and on being a doctor in Annals of Internal Medicine. I did read most of Jim's piece that he had written in Lancet, his essays. And I said, God, I got to write that someday. And so when Jim was staying with me, I told him a story. I said, Jim, this is a case, and this happened. And he said, Goshen, you got to write it up. And I said, I don't know how to write these things. And uh, I'm not a novelist, and I don't know how to write it. So I went to Taos, beautiful place in summer, nice full week there, and learned how to write. So, and they taught me, and with Sarah's and everybody helped, we did publish this one. And uh, that was probably, uh, this is probably I'm most uh, uh, happy about, 
is this story about a dozen eggs in Annals of Internal Medicine. And this was, this, this was a fascinating story. Um, and I got so many emails after this essay got out in Annals that about this uh, story. And this is a true story. And it was all about a twist to it and how this was presented was the hardest thing to do. It took me three years to write it. God knows how many attrition of this was written. And I'm sure Sarah has looked at every single, okay, what is the flavor of this has to be? So I learned a lot, so I'm happy. So even if I don't write any more about this, I'm good. I think I, 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 I accomplished what I wanted to do is on being a doctor. So then came this last thing is systems engineering. So I have no idea about this. So it came about that, hey, there is this UT system, want to give money for systems engineering we want to write a grant. So originally I left it to the hospital administration to write, they had two, three ideas. I said, you know what, we want to write on our own. So we wrote on COPD, so that got funded. So this is gonna go on for next three years for systems engineering. So we have health IT and systems engineering grant looking at industrial engineering. So actually tomorrow I'm giving a talk at MD Anderson. So we actually have a systems engineering retreat to discuss what all we learn and where all we need to uh, go to. So this is just my ladder, you know, graduate in 95, residency, chief residency fellowship, and uh, got promoted in 2009 and got tenured in 2010, became a director in 2011 and got a distinguished chair and got a UT system uh, health IT fellow. There are like 18 fellows across UT system who do quality improvement uh, stuff, and those are my uh, grants that are still going on. And I'm part of with the gym on his hospit list, uh, out of one. So in summary, develop a vision, okay? Have a vision for yourself, whatever that may be. Where do you want to see yourself in five years, three years, six years, whatever that vision may be. I think it is important to have, have a vision. And the next thing is cultivate a plan, have a plan. And I think the best way to do is look at the APT proposal, see what all needs to be there in your package that needs to take you where you need to go next. I question that focus issue, that's why I put it. I, I don't think staying focused help, now that's me. Okay, maybe I have some ADHD, uh, but it worked for me. I'm not treated, so I'm fine, so. I, I don't think focus helps, but seek advice frequently and regularly. So I think this is important where uh, mentoring comes into play. And periodically reassess. So see what you have set yourself as goal for. So I, you would say, hey, you know what? I want to submit two abstract next year, and I want to submit one publication. You know, and then look at the end of the year. Have you done that? One of the things is people have this tendency and there was a beautiful paper written in uh, Annals about a year ago about effect of your social structure, who you hang around with. You know, if you want to hang around with people who just think negative effect of everything, then you ain't going to proceed. Stay away from that, okay? Your inner circle should be all positive influence. Outer circle, keep them out, okay? People who think, why are you working hard? You know, you're still going to make your salary. So what you worried about? So I think you've got to stay away from that because it's your career and you need to decide that am I, is this is what I need to do or do I need to do something more than that? And then enjoy the journey. I think the beauty, beautiful part of this whole thing is I don't think I get happier on the day something get come out or published or get the grant. It's the journey. It's like the rigor you put into it. By the time you're already exhausted when something comes out, the only thing then it becomes a news for the institution, then you get all those emails, which is nice. But for you, you have already gone through it. And you already know what journey you have taken and all the people you have met across the way. And I think that is most, more important than the actual uh, end results of what you do. And perseverance, you know, this is what my famous quote is, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it's the courage that continue that counts. So I think failure is part of it, and uh, you don't want to give it up. You know, there is a paper, there was a, f a resident here, uh, Gopal, he wanted to do some research, and we did a trend in um, blind pleural biopsy. When I came here, I didn't think blind pleural biopsies should be done for patients. 
And so we wanted to study that. We said, we still do it, so it'll be great for us to study that because we will have enough number. So, and because we have prison population, they do get TB, so pleural biopsies is good for TB. So we end up uh, writing that paper, we presented it. So it went to one journal, two journal, three journal, four journal, five, six, seven, eight. So after eighth journal, it got published. So one of the thing is, once it is written, it does not stay on your computer. Somebody will take a bite at it. So going back to that clinical intervention in aging, the Dove Press um, uh, thing, because I got an email from them that, hey, we have this journal called Core Evidence, and we want you to be the editor-in-chief of that. Would you mind taking it? So that is how that paper led them to invite me to serve as an editor-in-chief editor for their journal. It's an online journal for core evidence, so, so I still review their articles to go from there and help them out. So you can see how everything is tied to something that happened previously, and it all rolls down uh, from there. So that is all I have to say, and I'll be happy to take any questions.